Thank you, Madison. It's a challenge, isn't it, for us to stand still and let God do something. We always want to get our hand in or something to help out. Thank you. The scripture reading this morning is taken from James 5, verse 7. James is a small book in the toward the back of your Bible. If you go too fast, you'll miss it totally. I was looking for the verse earlier this morning, and I thought, hmm, does James have five chapters? But it does. <laughs> James 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient over it until it receives the early and the late rain. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see all of you. You look like your brothers and sisters. You all have the same look to you this morning. Except for Chris Lemonian. He has quite a bit different look this morning with the patriotic uh, mass there this morning. just want to say thank you for Stephen Barb playing the music and Annette leading us in song and, and for the Lemonian special music. And Heidi, thank you for that children's story. It is great to be together in worship today with you. And I ask that you will bow your heads in prayer as we invite the Lord to come in and send his Holy Spirit um, as we open up his word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sabbath day and for just the beautiful sun that we've had and for the way that you've looked after your family and, and taking care of us through difficult times and through good times. And I ask today, Lord, as we open up your word and we learn about patience, that you will uh, open our hearts and minds and help us, Lord, to be patient, to patiently wait on you, to sit still and know that the answer may not come when we want, but that you have an answer for us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was, as I so often do, I was sitting and, and thinking about things. And um, one of the things I was thinking about was patience. You know, we, we live in a society today that patience is not our strong suit, right? We don't like to wait for anything, right? We want things now. Um, I think about food. We'd like it prepared quickly and, and not take a long time to prepare. We'd like a place. We'd like our job. We'd like things to work out now. Everything is kind of in a fast mentality for us. We access things, and you might have seen me looking on here some, using this as, as, my, as my Bible. I have access to the Word of God quickly, and I can search for words and find things where I used to have to pull out. Remember the concordance you'd pull out that was thick and heavy, and you'd flip through it and try to find different things and find the different meanings? We still have those, but you have them, I have them here too, and it's so fast. It's so easy to get those answers right away. And really, there's something very fundamentally lost for us when everything happens so fast. Because part, one of the building blocks of our faith is to have patience. You know, um, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. It's, it's one of the things that we're told that we need to have. In fact, in Revelation 14, 12, it says, here is the what? The patience of the saints. In other words, it's not a quick fix. It's a journey and we keep the law of God and have the faith of Jesus. Right? Amen? So I wanted to just delve into this a little bit as I was thinking about it. I was like, well, what does it mean to be patient? You know, what does it really mean to be patient? And what is God saying when he asks us to be patient? So I just went to the dictionary and decided to look up what this word means for us. And here it is. The quality of being patient as the bearing, we bear provocation, we bear annoyance, misfortune, or pain without complaint. Hmm. Or loss of temper, or being irritated, or anything like that. So, I read that and I thought, that's really interesting because God says he wants to change our heart. So it's more than just an outward expression. It's internally, when I'm patient, I'm not just doing it as an outward show, internally, I'm not irritated, I'm not angry, 
I deal with provocations, annoyances, and misfortune and pain without complaint, even in my own heart and mind. That's a big, tall order, isn't it? Any of you dealt with pain or misfortune or annoyances? Yeah, do you know anybody that might be annoying besides John Singletary? <laughs> I see fingers. This is the time to point fingers. <laughs> But we all actually have our own idiosyncrasies. We have, if your, your spouse knows you better than anyone else. They know what we're prone to do. My wife knows me and can sometimes end my sentences and knows how I'm going to respond to the information. And she knows how I am. And, and she knows my own idiosyncrasies that can be annoying. Right? But if, we're, if she is to be patient with me and I with her, I do not, even in my heart, lose my temper or be irritated or complain about that. Isn't that interesting? Another, uh, expanding on this idea of patience, it's the ability or willingness to suppress restlessness. Anyone be restless? You want something to happen and you're just restless for it to happen? When is that going to happen? You know, when are we going to open church back up? You know, restless for getting things going. I've been there. I've been guilty of that. Um... Quiet, steady perseverance, diligent, even tempered, um, suffer patiently. Patience. So God asks us to be patient. When you think of these things, let's look at our, our text that we were, we were talking about that uh, Jay read for us. As we read that text, God asks us to be patient. Look what he says in James 5. He says, be patient, therefore... If we were going to be, um, put this into words and give it, uh, give it its definition, we could say, do not be annoyed, do not be easily provoked, do not be irritated, do not lose your, you know, do not become, you know, annoyed with the coming of the Lord. Don't be impatient and restless with the coming of the Lord. It's interesting, isn't it? Behold, the husbandman, husbandman waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it. I know that in our garden, it is a process. When you're waiting for the garden to grow or for the trees to produce, you know, the trees produce once a year. You know, the apples come on once a year. We wait all year long for those apples to produce on that tree. We're not running down to uh, a store and getting it right away. It takes time. It takes patience. So also, you be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near. So we're just supposed to be waiting patiently for the Lord. It reminds me of another text. When I think of the text of uh, Isaiah 40, if you want to turn with me to Isaiah 40, this is probably uh, my favorite text in the, uh, our whole, favorite scripture in the whole of uh, the scriptures. But this is Isaiah 40, starting with verse 25. It says, To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One. It's Isaiah 40, verse 25. It's God asking, you know, to whom will you liken me to? Uh, who shall I be equal? You know, when they try to appraise the value of a home, they try to look at all the different compatible properties or, or properties around that are similar to your home to get a kind of a price or a value to your home. And God's asking, who will you compare me to? Of how will you distinguish my value? Who is there like that? Says the Holy One. He says, who is my equal? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, he who created these things, that brings out of the host by number, he calls them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, and not one fails. So why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Why do you say, O Israel, that God does not notice you, that your way is hidden from the God who created all things? That means, from this scripture, uh, uh, guys, that God knows exactly about what you're going through today. He knows exactly what you're experiencing. He, in fact, we read, he knows our inward thoughts. That's kind of a little scary, isn't it? God knows you, and what's, what's really amazing about this is that God knows you that well, and he still loves you. God knows me that well, and he still loves me. But it goes on further. It says, Have you not known and have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator at the ends of the earth, he does not faint, neither is he weary, and there is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even youths 
shall faint and be weary, and young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord will what? They will renew their strength. Wait on the Lord. Those who patiently wait on the Lord. They'll renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, it's interesting when, uh, when I was looking this up, there's a lot of studies going on right now about patience. And one of the studies that I found was that there's so many benefits, and I'm doing this for Connie. So this is for you, Connie. But there's so many health benefits, social benefits, and spiritual benefits for patients. So patients can do a lot of things for you. Just, just to kind of sum this up, one of the things that patients does, that the, there was a big study that went on over at Berkeley, and they said that they have found that people who are patient enjoy better mental health. That just kind, of, just kind of makes sense, right? You think of someone who's impatient, they're red-faced, they're upset, they got road rage, they're grumbling in line at the grocery store, they're upset that this has happened to them, they expected the promotion, somebody else got the promotion, and they're just, they're just upset about how things are turning out, and they're not patient, and they're not, they're just not, they're allowing things to annoy and irritate, and so it says here, people who are patient and they studied a lot of people with this. They found that those who are patient universally enjoy better health. So when God asks us to be patient, it really is for our own good, isn't it? For our own, own better health. Another thing that they said was that people who are patient, they found out, are better friends and neighbors. <laughs> Go figure. You're just a better neighbor and a better friend if you're patient. Yeah. Maybe it's because the person who is patient is able to put up the quirkiness and the, and the things that somebody does. And maybe somebody doesn't really mean to be disrespectful or not do something that you'd like them to do. But you just, you put up more with that if you're patient. And people like to feel belonged and like to feel loved. And when you still love someone and care about them and are patient with them, that's a pretty big deal, isn't it? If someone's taken a while to learn something and if you're patient with them, that, that has value to them as a person and they like to be around you. So it makes sense that, that those who uh, are patient people, it says that they found that patient people were more cooperative, empathetic, and forgiving. If you're patient. Kind of just sounds like our building blocks for Christianity, doesn't it? You know, that we talk about, but we'll go through that a little bit about how we build on patient, but... Patience does those things. Another thing that patience does, they found in the study, is it helps you achieve your goals. If you're impatient and annoyed and irritable and angry, you achieve less of your goals than if you do when you're patient. And sometimes if it's worth, you know, if it's worth a lot, it's worth waiting for, right? Helps you achieve your goals. And then not only is patience linked to bent good mental health, it is linked as well, they said it links to good health. That you have a longer life and you have a lot less headaches, acne, ulcers, and a long list of other health ailments that are related to impatience and getting upset. So there's a lot to be, when God says be patient, he really wants us to take care of our own mental and our physical health. And he wants us also to take care of our social friendships. And he wants us to prosper, to reach our goals. All of those come from the study, from that, from a, a secular study on patience. Look what it says. What are the things, as I was thinking about being patient, we've already studied about being patient and waiting on the Lord. But another thing that we are to be patient with, if you'll turn with me to Romans 15, one of the other things that we were to be patient with was we were to be patient with other people. Now, it's, it's hard to be patient with other people, um, but the Bible asks us to be patient with others. Look what it says in Romans 15, 1. When then that are strong ought to bear the, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to just please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good and to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached fell upon me. 
For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to have the same mind and be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus. That you all may with one mind and one mouth glorify God even as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore receive you one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. How did Christ receive us? As I thought about this, how did Christ receive me? He received me while I was yet a sinner, right? Christ said, I died for you while you were yet sinners. Right? I came to you first. I, I gave myself and professed I love you. If you know I had a couple, who's the first one that said I love you? You know, your couple's talking about who was the first one that said it? God was the first one who said I love you. And he died for us while we were yet sinners. And he, and he came and lived on this planet, the creator of the entire universe, who created all things and nothing made without him, came and lived his life as a man and died on a cross and bore our sins for us that he, we might have his righteousness. And he says that we should be like-minded for those around us. How will that make us interact with each other as we have this Christ-like mindedness in us today? If we look at each other with patience and consolation. So when I talk with you, it is through patience and consolation. I am not short-tempered and impatient and rushed. And there's times things may happen where you may have to have patience with me because maybe something's happening in my life. But my overall goal, my object is to be reflective of Christ. That I need to have that kind of patience. This is the kind of patience I was talking to my wife this morning. This is not the kind of patience that I put on as an outward show. This is internally because... It says that even inside, we are not being stirred up in our, in our emotions, that we are patient. It is something that's inside. We're not like a shiny sepulcher and like dry bones inside. It's really who we are. Our hearts have changed. And this is a process that can't happen, I don't believe, without the Holy Spirit working on our hearts and God moving upon our hearts. But I see you as someone, as God's son and daughter, as my brother and sister, and I care about you. And you see me the same way. And therefore it says, we glorify God together and look forward to his coming. Right? Doesn't it say that this is how all men shall know that you are my disciples? That you have what? Love one for another. It's really not easy to love if you're impatient. Is it? It's really not. I mean, full confession, I found myself getting upset at my children way too early. Any parents? You don't have to raise your hands. I found myself getting upset about situations way, like I shouldn't be getting upset. And I have to go to God and ask him to give me a heart like his, right? And I go to him and ask him for that. He freely gives us those things if we ask. But we are to, we are to honor other folks that are with us and have patience with them. Look now, turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, just a little bit more about this. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14. About being patient again with your neighbors here today and those that are watching on the live stream and your neighbors and your co-workers and people on the road that are driving crazy. Verse 14 of chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians says, Now we exhort you, brothers, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, but in all of those things... Be patient toward all men. Are we patient with the unruly, the feeble-minded, and the weak? Are we patient with them? So on both extremes, those who are quick to express their opinion and type A personality that stirs the pot and maybe just maybe tips the card over, we're to be patient with them. We can warn them about their unruliness. We, we need to be patient. Those that are feeble-minded and are, are easily uh, filled with concern and anxiety and overwhelmed, we support them. And those who are weak, we support them as well. Verse 15 says, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and, what? To all men. So not just amongst ourselves, but to all men. 
We are to have patience and not render evil for evil. That's a big, that's a big ask. That's a big, let's turn to another scripture. This is found in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, 24. 2 Timothy 2, 24. It says this. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. There it is again. Patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Well, there's our picture. If we really have it and we look through the glass through Jesus' lens, we can really see that those who do not possess the fruits of the Spirit are those who are trapped in the snare of the devil. Don't we have compassion on those that find themselves trapped or hurting? If, if you've ever seen anyone trapped in a situation, that it, your heart goes out to them. And all around us are men and women, young and old, who are trapped in the snare of the devil. Who do not know the blessings and the peace that passes understanding. Who do not know the good news. Of the, they may have heard about, but they don't understand fully of what it means to have that peace. And to have that joy that refreshes and is new every morning. And know and have, know that God died for us and that he who has begun a good work is faithful to complete it to its end. They don't know that he's coming again on the clouds of glory and they don't know that no matter what happens, whether good or bad, that God is with me always. See, when we look at the lens through Christ's lens and we see life as he sees life, we know that we have a home with him, right? He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And in my Father's house are many mansions, are many rooms. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. But I go away to prepare a place for you, that, that when I come again, I may receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. See, though, those are the messages that the world doesn't know. And they don't know that peace. And they don't know that joy. And they don't know the gospel of Christ. And so, and it, and it crops up in our own Church family, where someone forgets and begins to be unruly or begins to misbehave. And we are instructed, I am instructed, to always, in my interactions with you, to be patient, to not be annoyed, to not be provoked, not be irritated, but to love you as a child of God that's been caught in the snare of the devil and to have compassion on you. And not wait for you to be kind to me, because Christ did not wait. But in the, his like-mindedness, reach out and extend my life and my love toward you, even while you're not responding in that way toward me. That is hard to do. Um, that is very hard to do. There's other texts in the Bible that talks about how we are not supposed to be provoked or upset when we see the unrighteous prospering and those that are serving God suffering under persecution um, maybe even uh, dying or, or having illness. And Lord, it doesn't seem to be fair. And the Bible says, don't think that way because I will make all things right. Right? We expect the count sometimes to be zeroed out in this life, but we are strangers in a foreign land. We are just sojourners through here. We're pointing our way toward a heavenly kingdom with a city whose builder and maker is God. This is not our home. This is a sin-filled place where bad things happen to good people. Because sin exists. But God is keeping account of all those things and will one day make all things right. And he has promised us a home with him when he comes. That is what we have to look forward to. We do not need to be upset or impatient with the things that are happening in the world. I hear people getting upset. Myself has been in some of these conversations also upset. But I hear people getting upset about how things are going politically. I hear people upset how things are going socially. I hear people getting upset about how things are going at work. And they're upset about what somebody said and what somebody's doing. And, and now that I've said this, what should be our response and how should we be in those moments? Should the politics of our age, should the events in our environment, should any of that cause us to be provoked or irritated 
or angry or impatient in any way, annoyed. We should be able to bear it with patience, it says. So that, one, we can experience the joys of better mental health, better good health, physical health, a stronger social network, and be reaching our goals, right? Those are the things that we can do. Good. So I was thinking about this to wrap it up today. I was thinking, well, how do we achieve patience? Have you thought about that? I laugh because one of the things I hear quite frequently, and I've said it myself, be careful to pray for patience. <laughs> you pray for patience, and you're going to have some tribulation come upon you, right? And that comes from a text that I want to I read uh, together with you. Let's, um, let's go to that text here. Um, I have to find it. Here we go. James 1. James 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various temptations or diverse temptations. How many of you honestly say, Oh, good, there's another temptation coming? <laughs> this is awesome. Another trial. You know, that's just not in our human nature, right? We, we don't like to have, we, we like things to be easier. Don't like to have a trial or a tribulation come upon us. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work. Listen, this is how important patience is in your spiritual life. Let patience have her perfect work that you, all of you, may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's how, how important is patience in your spiritual experience? Isn't that important? Patience, perfect work, is that you yourself become perfect and entire. You become complete and entire, wanting nothing. That's pretty powerful. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse uh, temptations. There's another text that I was uh, reading about this, the trials. Um, it says, <clears throat> it says, this is in Romans 5, it says in verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience, right? So I guess that, you know, you don't want to have, you want to be careful about praying for patience because you're going to have tribulation, right? I, one of the ways that you grow in your patience is to have tribulation. It's interesting, but children who are going through a tough time sometimes have the most calm demeanor and they're more concerned about how you're doing than they are. Now, I don't find this true with adults as they go through maybe cancer. I don't always find I do find it in some adults, but depending on where their walk is with God or their view of life, but with children, almost universally, they will be more concerned about how you're doing as their mom and dad with their life-ending cancer, their leukemia, than, than they are worried about themselves. They'll be more concerned about how the nurse is that comes and treats them than they'll be worried about themselves. And as I look at this, and I look at this uh, trial, that tribulation that the child's going through builds in them what? Patience. They really, you know, it says unless we become like little children. I think that's one of the evidences that I have, as I've seen as I work in hospice, that, you know, the evidence of becoming like a little child. Just being patient. Not being impatient. Looking at things differently through a different lens. And, and not allowing those things that happen in our life to disrupt us. And so, I say tribulation God is greater than any tribulation that comes in my life or yours. Right? Amen? I don't seek tribulation. I don't go out and say, hey, bring it on. That might be foolish, foolhardy of me. But when tribulation comes, it says that we glory in tribulations because tribulation works patience. And look what patience does here. Patient brings experience. Experience brings hope. And hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So it begins, again, with patience, right? Have you thought about how important that word is in our conduct and behavior as a Christian, as a follower of God? That how we interact and how we respond internally says a lot of how much we have allowed God to be with us. 
The Bible says that we are to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. We are not to walk selfishly with our God. We are to walk humbly with our God. And we are to give up of ourselves and, you know, deny ourselves and follow Christ, right? Isn't that what he told his disciples? Follow me. Let's look at Galatians 5.22 as well. That's another place. Galatians 5.22 and 23. This is the often quoted in red scripture where it talks about the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, is love, joy, peace. King James says long-suffering, but you can, it means patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and temperance or self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit, things just, they, are, they are fruit that are given to us. When we come to Christ and ask him to change our heart, he says that all who come to me I will no wise cast out. You do not need to come to him prepped and prepared and ready and ready. To, you just go to him as you are. Remember the story of the prodigal son in which the prodigal son found himself eating the food of swine, living in filth. His father was well-to-do and lived in a nearby area. And he said, you know what? Even the servants of my father do better than I'm doing. I'm going to go and ask him to have mercy and invite me in as a servant. What he didn't know is that the father was looking every day for his son. And when he saw his son coming, he didn't wait for him to arrive. He ran and met him a long way off. And he put his robe on him, put his signet ring on him, and declared a feast. And they celebrated that his son who was lost has now come home. Do we believe that even though we might find ourselves in a parallel situation as a prodigal son, that our God is that gracious to us. That God loves us so much that when we come back to him, he meets us, we don't have to go, he meets us along the way back. And he puts his robe of righteousness on us and his signet ring and adopts us into his family and we are joint heirs with Christ. Do we believe that? Because God says that I, all of my promises are true and I'm faithful, right? I am not slack concerning my promises. I will keep them. And he promises to give us this new life. But how important is it to have patience with those around us, with ourselves, with our work, with our church? You can pick on Gilbert Sissons to have patience with Gilbert Sissons. Or any of those are friends that are around us that we need to have patience with. It is important. Let's go back to what God, what this is saying to us in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit. So we ask how. We know that there's benefits to being patient. Physically, mentally, socially, even economically in reaching our goals. We know that we are to be patient with God and his coming and wait for him and not give up on our faith, but to keep patiently waiting for his return and to patiently wait for him and to work in our lives. We are to be patient and not annoyed by that wait. We are to be patient with each other. And we are to be patient with the things that are happening in the world that we have really sometimes have, most times have no control over. And we understand all this, but how do we get there? And we understand also that patience is the building block upon which our experience and everything that's built upon that develops into hope, which spreads the love of God abroad in our hearts. And that Patience has its perfect work in us. How do we get that patience? And here I read in Galatians 5.22, that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples that before you go out and you share the good news of Christ, wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit to be poured out on you. In the 40 days of prayer, a lot of what we studied was asking for the Holy Spirit to be poured out in our lives, to be given to us freely and abundantly, poured out so that we will know the words to say and to, to live the life and, and that we be transformed. The Bible says that if you ask, uh, you shall receive. Um, and the reason why we don't receive, if you go back a little further in the book of James, James 4.2 says, you don't receive because you've not asked. And so if we ask for God to give us the fruit of patience, and really all the fruits of the Spirit, he will give us that. He says, all who come unto me I will in no wise cast out. I will answer your prayer before you ask it. He says in other places. 
I know your needs before you know your own needs. And I knew you before you were even born. Is that not an awesome God? And then we are told not to think it's strange when fiery trials overtake us, as if some strange thing has happened to us. We know that in the world we will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, God has overcome the world. And so as tribulations come, we can glory in them, and the hardships come, we can glory in them. So we can glory as a church together in the hardships that we're having today, which I'm sure many of you can share some of the hardships. There's much more loneliness right now, and there's a lot more folks feeling isolated right now. There's a lot of people frustrated about how things are happening. But if we invite the Holy Spirit into our heart, and we ask him to work in our hearts and give us the fruit of the Spirit, he will do that. And he will give us patience. And we will not only be patient with the events and things happening around us, but we'll be patient with ourselves, with our families, with our friends and those that are around us. We'll be patient at work and where we go. And we'll be patient with God. It's interesting, as I studied the word patience and waiting, I found tremendously more counsel in the Bible about being patient with God than even being patient with our fellow man. There's a lot more instruction in the Bible about being patient and waiting on God than there is about being patient and waiting on our fellow man. It seems like we're prone to get impatient with God. Like Abraham wanting to have a child and moving ahead of God's plans. Sometimes we want to put things in our own way and we want to do it in our own manner and we don't want to wait for God to come with a solution. I love the special music. That wasn't pre-planned, so uh, the Lemonians with that special music about be still and wait. You know, the answer may not come right now, but it's coming. We can have that kind of a walk with God, and that's where we need to be. And, and so today, as you look at that in the scriptures where it says that we need to be patient with God, I think above all things, we need to be patient and wait for God, Right? We don't always understand why things are happening. And in my line of work, I don't understand or have an answer of why things happen to people. I see great and good people fall victim to terminal illness every week. And I don't have an answer about why. But I know that I am encouraged to be patient with God. And to not lean into my own understanding, but lean unto His, right? Right? Acknowledge him in all my ways. And as I lean on God and trust that he is working things out in his time and in his way, I know that all things will be made right. And all accounts will be, will be um, leveled out and made right when he comes again. So this is the hope that I have today, that hope of glory that Jesus is coming again soon. And that he is going to come from the clouds of glory. That he's going to shout with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with him. And there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. We need to pray for patience. And as we bow our heads today, I just want you to really spend time thinking about that. And through this week, think about what it means to be patient with God. Maybe the Holy Spirit speaking with us today to be patient with God's plan and his timing. And maybe he's speaking to us today to be patient with someone in our family or with a friend. Or maybe with our job or our work or lack of job. But whatever he's being asked, whatever we're having in our life that's that annoyance or that trial and tribulation, let it be for God's glory. And, and give it over to him and let him take that. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you will be with us today and through this week. And Lord, a simple message today about patience. Thank you for sharing this with us through your word. Lord, we don't have it in us to be patient like what the counsel is. We need your Holy Spirit to move in our hearts and our minds. Please take out our stony hearts and give us a heart of flesh. Create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Help us, Lord, to see others as you do and to have, be like-minded like you and, and be willing to serve those around us without irritation or provocation or being angry. Let us not worry about the things that are around us in our life to fret not because you have already overcome the world and you're promising to come again and restore things. 
Lord, we thank you for all the promises. May our lives be a witness. May this patience that you've planted in our hearts today, may it grow to bear its perfect work, that we may be perfect and found wanting of nothing, so that when you come again, we may enter into your kingdom. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.